Good morning, everybody. Why don't you stand with us this morning as we worship? We're so glad that you're here with us at Warden. We're going to worship together this morning. Welcome. We're so glad you're worshiping with us this morning. Uh, if you're online, we welcome you as well. Um, we're going to continue to worship. He is good. Amen. Feel 
again. There's nothing. Well, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Yeah, I'm not afraid. You turn shame into glory. Later it says, you turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. He works everything out for our good, doesn't he? We can take those times of sadness and they can be, t be times of excitement. We can take those times of suffering and they can be times of joy through him. We can suffer. We can go through difficult times. We can experience depression. We can experience uh, difficult, difficult times uh, financially, um, even, even in your jobs, in your school. But he can take those difficult things and turn them into things for our good. So let's sing about that again. We're going to sing, You Turn Mourning Into Dancing. If that means you got to dance, you can dance. That's all right. Um, but we're going to sing that again together. And you turn everything for our good.
there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Let's sing just our voices. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Better than you, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Amen, amen. There's nothing better than you, Lord. You are king over everything. You are ruler over our lives. You turn shame into glory. You turn seas into highways. You turn times of suffering into times of joy. Lord, we thank you that you make things work out for our good. Lord, we submit to your will and the things that you have for us. Would we hear you? Would we feel in tune with your voice, with your Holy Spirit? first verse again I will sing and I will sing for you alone have rescued this life Jesus you have set me free and you alone took away all sin and disgrace when you gave your life to ransom me I am forgiven at the foot of the cross, I am accepted by the power of your love. By every stain is washed away. I am forgiven. Here I stand. And here I stand in the light of your glory and grace. Heaven's love and justice me. Now I live for the one who has called me by name, who is risen and alive in me. I am forgiven at the foot of the cross. I am accepted. By the power of your love, my every stain is washed away. I am forgiven. Sing that again. I am forgiven. And I am forgiven. At the foot of the cross, I am accepted. By the power of your love. Every stain is washed away. I am forgiven. Yes, I am. I am forgiven. Call me wrong. I am forgiven. Oh. See it out. I'm embraced. And I'm embraced at the foot of the 
cross by the love and mercies you have lavished on us my every stain is washed away and I am By the power of your love, my every stain is washed away. I am forgiven. Let's just stand in his presence for a few moments. Sing your own song to him or continue to sing this song. We worship you, Lord. We worship you. Continue to sing of his goodness together.
good. You are good. You are a provider. You are a provider. You cover us with your protection. You shower us with your love. We worship you because you are good. Amen. Amen. Let's just stand in his presence for another minute here. We worship you, Lord. being with us this morning. Lord, we lift you up. We pray that this rest of this service would be yours in your name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated for some announcements. Hi, my name is Connie and I'm one of the pastors here at Warden and I'd like to welcome you to our service. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we are so glad that you chose to worship with us today. If you're new to Warden and have never filled out a connection card, we invite you to do that today so that we can get to know you and help you get connected. There are a couple of ways to fill it out. You can text I'm new exactly as it appears on the screen, no spaces or punctuation, to 647-371-1007. Or you can pick up a connection card from the guest services desk before you leave. We also want to thank you for your faithful giving. If you're in person, you can give on your way out by dropping your giving in the boxes provided. If you're giving online, go to wardenfulgospel.com give or click the give button in the chat room right now. It's a safe and secure way to give. You can also mail in your regular giving or drop it off at the church during the week. Kids, you can now be dismissed for Children's Church. Have fun. Now, if you're interested in being water baptized, please let us know. You can contact myself or Pastor Orlando. And youth camp is the week of August 13th to the 18th, and you still have time to register. Just go to BethelPark.ca. Also, organizers are currently looking for volunteers. And if you're interested, you can find an application at BethelPark.ca. Just go to Featured Camps and click Youth Camp. 
I also want to wish all the fathers that are here today or listening online a very happy Father's Day. For all the guys who are here, you're going to receive a special treat as you leave. You're going to get a chocolate bar. Now you can choose between a Kit Kat because we think you deserve a break today or a Mars bar because you're out of this world. But for Pastor Orlando, I got a Snickers bar because he's not himself when he's hungry. Now here's Pastor Peter with today's message. Praise God. Amen. Yeah, just go ahead and give the fathers a hand this morning. Amen. I know I'm one of them, so thank you, thank you. I'm just kidding. I just want to, on behalf of Warden Full Gospel Assembly, I want to just issue a happy Father's Day to all the fathers, all those prospective fathers. And uh, I just want to honor you today, men who are here and just trying to live your best life for God. Amen? And try to be the best example you can. Whew. I love being a dad. And I know uh, some of you are probably even watch me over here and I'm having to stop and do this and stop and do that. But you know what? It's worth it. My kids are sitting with me in church. It's worth it. You know, I have the highest call in my life is to serve my Savior. But next to that is to be the best husband I possibly can be and to raise my kids to fear God and to love Him. So that is it. Everything else comes after that. Amen? Amen. So you dads, uh, I could list a bunch of stats of why you're so important to the church here today, but I want you to be honored. I want you to understand that above all, we answer to a Heavenly Father. Amen? So you might be in this room this morning and you say, boy, am I, I don't really know if I get the whole idea of a dad or, or Abba father. I didn't really have a good one growing up. I want to tell you today that he is a good, good father. And then you can feel the love of a father. I often tell people that I, I equate the presence of God to my dad's big hand on the back of my head when he would pray for me as a boy. I remember kneeling at the altar and my dad's hand, I, I mean, he has a big hand. He's a big man. And when I felt it on my small, smaller head when I was younger, I equate that now. When the presence of God comes on me, I equate those two things. And that's what it feels like. I feel his presence just like I feel my dad's presence and I feel his his guidance and direction, and boy, do we need it to be dads in this generation. Amen? So I honor you folks. I bless you today. I also want to make mention that next Sunday, I believe it's June 25th, we have our spring offering that we're coming up, and we have some project that we want to get done in the church and to make things a little bit easier for us to get around in here. We're hoping, you know, at some point to start a project where we can get the bathrooms fixed up here and get some renovations done. So I just want you to pray about it. I'm not going to tell you to come and bring this amount of money or that amount of money. I want you to pray about it and ask God and say, God, what would you have me give to this project? What would you have me give and uh, support this project? Because, uh, you know, we got to take care of his house, amen? And we got a lot of people that need bathrooms up here and more of them, amen? So we want to do this to make sure that uh, we're taking care of the family of God and anybody who comes to visit. That's a good thing. So just pray about that this week and think about it and uh, ask God what he would lay on your heart to give. Praise God. So we had a chance. Actually, we came in Friday and uh, I was actually coming in to check to see if this big camper was still in the driveway. And I said to Carrie, and, and Carrie Ann actually said to me, well, why don't we go check out the worship night uh, with the teenagers? And boy, I'm so glad we did. We ended up coming in, and I, I, told, I told Pastor Orlando, I was like, we were just going to stop in and everything, but they were, so, they were excited to see us, and we, we were just sitting and worshiping, and the next thing you know, we sat through the whole service, and I got to hear this young man, Darnell, share his heart, and I, I wrote something down that he said, and I just want to share it with you real quick. Orlando already knows what I'm going to talk about here. But he said, this is the statement he said, he says, the fruit that is shown, he's talking about the fruit of the Spirit, he says, the fruit that is shown can be a seed that is sown. Amen? Just take that in for a second. A fruit that is sown, a fruit that is shown can be a seed that is sown. And I'm like, wow, what an amazing 
God we serve, a Holy Spirit that can plant that little nugget in that young man's heart to share with those kids on, Sunday, on, on Friday night. And so I was blessed by Darnell. I was blessed by uh, able to be here and worship with them. And it's great, you know, God is doing some good things with the youth at Warden. Amen? And I'm going to tell you, the youth in Scarborough need Jesus. Amen? We got to reach out. We got to be thinking about generations. And I'm going to be talking about that next week a little bit about how God has planned for this church to be multi-generational. Amen? Okay. I'm going to get into Word this morning because if I keep talking, you're going to tack this onto my sermon time and it's going to make it sound like I preach for an hour. So I'm just saying that everything I just said, that wasn't part of my sermon. So don't go coming up to me later and saying I preach for 55 minutes. All right. We can joke, right? I got to see if I can come up with a few dad jokes before the end of the day. God is good. Uh, I got about three weeks I want to talk about the church and society. Today is number two, and next week we're going to keep going on this path a little bit. But last week we talked about uh, the hope that the church has and how we have an opportunity to infuse society with this hope. I don't know about you, but I don't necessarily feel a lot of hope outside these walls. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying I don't interact with happy people, but hope is not something that's all that prevalent. We employed a very simple definition of the church, and I'll just repeat that for you this morning, is that the church is the body of Christ, all the people who accept Christ's gift of salvation and follow Christ's teaching. I want to keep this definition simple because I just want you to realize that it's not a big complicated thing to become part of the church. It's accept this gift of salvation provided by Jesus Christ on the cross. And you're part of this church. You're part of the family of God, the greater kingdom of God, which Jesus came to inaugurate, and we get to be a part of for eternity. Amen? I don't know what you, I get excited when I talk about that stuff. I get excited when I talk about, say words like eternity. It's hard to think about, but I get excited. It makes me wake up tomorrow and remind me that I, as part of God's kingdom, it's eternal. And we need to keep that in our mind. Dr. Duran Gray, uh, pastor of Transformation Church, um, not exactly sure where in the States, but he wrote a book called Building a Multi-Ethnic Church, and he said this, he's adding to the definition of church, he says, the local church is God's grand prototype that displays to the world how humanity is to love one another. We are to be an example of how to love one another. We run into trouble when we allow ourselves to believe that we, the church, are the sinless and everyone outside the church are the sinners and we are all, because we are all sinners in need of grace and mercy. Amen? The change comes when one accepts the grace and mercy provided by Jesus Christ and the death of his death and his resurrection and we get to accept the living God into our hearts and allow the Holy Spirit, the great advocate, to guide us through this life. I briefly mentioned an account last week in Acts chapter 8, um, and I would like to look at it a little closer today and consider what it teaches us about the church. Again, it's not really a passage that when people talk about the church, you hear preach about the church. It's not really a passage that you hear people go to a whole lot, but I, I, I like this passage because it talks about the beginnings of the church, but it's in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 40. Maybe it's familiar for you. It's a rather long passage, so I just invite you to follow along and all as I read it. It'll be on the screen, or you can look it up in your Bible or on your digital device, if you choose. Acts 8, 26 to 40 says this, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet, Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. 
He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before his shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with the very passage of scripture and told him the good news of Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is some water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Father, we thank you for your word. <laughs> Excuse me. Father, I'm just a vessel here today, Lord Jesus. And uh, I feel this great call to present this word, Lord Jesus, to pre preach your word with power and the authority that only you can place on my life to do it. And so, Father, I just pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you be the primary communicator in this room, that you would speak these words, Lord, in spite of me, to our hearts today. Inspire us to be challenged. Inspire us to be moved, Lord Jesus, to be more like you, to be the true example of the church to the world. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. Holy Spirit, we surrender. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. There's so much in this passage, but I, I just want to highlight a couple of defining characteristics. And that's what we're going to focus on in the next couple of weeks, defining characteristics of the church as displayed in this passage. And the first is simply this, is that the church is spirit-led. Amen? We're Pentecostal church. You should have said amen. You should have given me one right away there. Amen? amen? amen. The church is spirit-led. Yes. Amen. There we go. Philip is the... It's first mentioned in Acts chapter 6 as one of the seven chosen to care for the Hellenistic Jewish widows. And by Hellenistic, it means uh, Jewish people who have adopted the Greek language and culture. Uh, the divining characteristic of the chosen seven was that they were known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. Amen? There we go. We're getting better. I'll get you there by the end. <laughs> Sounds like pretty good requirements for somebody to be in ministry. Amen? Full of the Spirit, full of wisdom. I mean, those are good criteria. When you're looking for people to minister in the church, to people to serve in the church, to be full of the Spirit and full of wisdom. We also read about Philip in Acts chapter 5, verse 8, or chapter 8, verse 5, pardon me, where it says that he went down to Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. And we'll reference this account again a little later. But it is this interaction with the Ethiopian eunuch that uh, I would like to focus on for a few moments today. So we have to understand that as a church, the body of Christ, we are the blind leading the blind if we do not involve the spirit in our processes. I don't know that we can call ourselves a church if we do not acknowledge the spirit is indwelt within us. It is the defining characteristic of the church is the indwelt spirit. I love reading the passage in Luke when it says that he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. I think it actually says that in John, but the Luke passage, it says that he opened their eyes so they could understand the scripture. Do you feel the Holy Spirit's role, the advocate, the counselor, the guider, you know, the one who leads us into all truth? We have to understand that we're nothing more than the blind leading the blind with the spirit. In fact, I do not know, again, how the body could be, we could call ourselves a church if we do not acknowledge the spirit's role. The spirit's presence is and must be the defining characteristic of the church. So what is the church without the power of the spirit? It's a social club. That's it. Church without the power of the Holy Spirit is a social club. And I'm not saying that, that social clubs are bad. There's a lot of social clubs doing a lot of good things, but we don't need more social clubs. We need a spirit-empowered church. 
We need a spirit and body, power, body of Christ who understands what they can be doing for the kingdom of God when they just ask the spirit to guide them and direct them. Again, in Acts chapter 6 tells us that Philip was full of the spirit and wisdom. Acts 8, 26 gives us insight into this attention uh, to the leading of the spirit. It says, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. In the Old Testament, when we see a reference to the angel of the Lord, it is readily believed to be a reference to the pre-incarnate Christ. You know, when you read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego back in Daniel, you know, the, the three Hebrew boys who were in the fiery furnace. If you grew up in Sunday school, you know what I'm talking about. Amen? Am I the only one who put those little felt things on my couch when I got home from Sunday school? All right. Powerful story. If you haven't read it, go back to Daniel and read about the three Hebrew boys. There was a fourth that stood in the fire with them. It's believed to be the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, the God of all creation. Here in Acts, it's more commonly understood uh, as synonymous with the Spirit of the Lord. So when you hear the angel of the Lord, it's more synonymous with the, synonymous with the Spirit of the Lord. Again, just like the account in John 4 last week, this is not necessarily a passage that you would normally think about when you're talking about the church. Uh, but this is the burgeoning church. This is the beginnings of the church. This is when the church expanded from Jerusalem and went out. And, and it's the beginnings. And, and I love these accounts in early Acts. When I think about the account in Acts chapter 10, a little bit later, you know, where, where uh, Peter, Peter was reaching out to Cornelius, and there's a whole lot of things that happened to get that to happen. But, but we're talking about a man who, who was described as fearing the Lord. He feared the Lord, but he hadn't been able to accept Jesus Christ, so somebody told him how to do it. It's the beginnings of the church. It's the beginnings of people getting an opportunity to invite the Holy Spirit into their, their hearts to be indwelt, so that they, gave, they can become children of the living God. The beginnings of, beginnings of the body of Christ's formation, and it is important to know that it was defined by the Spirit's presence, by the counselor, the advocate, as he's referred to in the latter chapters of John. It is also important to understand that Philip, the apostles, and many other disciples were led by the Spirit and the Great Commission outside of the Jewish confines to Samaria. Actually, if we read at the beginning of chapter 8, we see that Philip went to Samaria first. He followed the example of his Lord and Savior from John chapter 4 that I preached on last week when Jesus Christ spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well. He followed that example, and the first place he went to was Samaria. He was obedient to the Spirit's leading to go to Gaza and as a result of his obedience, he has this incredible encounter with this high-ranking Ethiopian official. It says that this Ethiopian man was an important official in charge of the Kandake, which is the queen of the Ethiopians. Now, there's a lot of um, commentary about where this part of Africa actually was. We understand that he's from northern Africa, and... Uh, the NIV translates it as Ethiopia. Some people just make it more general, but Northern Africa. In other, in, at any rate, he's from the northern part of Africa. He's a high-ranking official to the queen, actually in charge of all the treasury. This is not just some slouch of a man. <laughs> he, he is a high-ranking official. It seems as though... Again, this high-ranking Ethiopian official had likely been converted to Ju Judaism at some point and was on a sojourn to Jerusalem and was likely maybe went there to actually get some scriptures. And this is how he ended up with the book of Isaiah in his hands, the scroll. And he was discovered reading by Philip. And this is where it gets cool. In verse 29, the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. So this is where we need to empathize with, with, with Philip just a little bit. So Philip, a Jew, again, likely a Hellenistic Jew, part of the reason why he was chosen in chapter 6 to, to attend to the Grecian Jewish widows. He's instructed by the Spirit to go near the chariot of the high-ranking foreigner. He had no reason to believe this would be a safe move. 
And to be honest, though it is a specific instruction, the why he would do such a thing was not necessarily provided. But Philip just understood the mission. But it isn't, isn't it true how sometimes when we sense God asking us to do something, we hesitate because we get so caught up in the why. I'm going to tell you right now that if I got caught up in the why, I would not be standing on this platform this morning. Because this all began with a stir in my heart. Began with a stir in my heart, you know, to, to step out and become a lead pastor again. But then it became more evident that this stir was leading me to stay in this city. And to speak the peace of Jesus and the truth of Jesus Christ, forgiveness in this city. And I didn't know all those things. I just felt this stir. And this stir led me to make a phone call to Pastor Jason Luscombe. And then the next door opened. Then the next door opened. Then the next door opened. We don't always get all the whys. Sometimes you get one door. And God says, twist the door and I'll walk through it and see what I got for you. And we're like, hold a minute. I'm used to using a GPS God. I like to see where the line gets red and where it gets yellow and how long it's going to be. And if you have children's dads, you know that they're sitting in the back seat. My kids like to see the little screen. And if I don't have the screen up, it's like there's a panic in the back seat. How much time do we have? Where are we going? What's going on? I mean, they just don't want nothing to do without having that little screen saying, well, how do I know how long it's going to take? It's like about five or six minutes. But is it five or is it six? They panic. They love that screen. They really do. We always want to know the reasons ahead of time. Or maybe it's just me. I don't know. But isn't it crazy that the why can oftentimes cloud the fact that the God of all creation has spoken? The important words in this passage is that the Spirit led So sometimes the Spirit speaks to our heart. We spend, and and I'm assuming that you spend time with Jesus and you spend time getting to know His voice. The assumption in the church is that you take the time every day to speak to your Savior, to get to know Him better so that you're familiar with His voice, so that you understand the shepherd's voice and you understand that the shepherd knows the sheep's voice. Right? There's there's an assumption that I'm making here that we're, we're getting to know His voice, but when He speaks and you know His voice, why do we doubt it? Philip wasn't concerned about the why. It says in verse 30 that he ran up to the chariot. He ran up to the chariot. And now it doesn't really specify if the chariot was still moving or not. That would be funny, wouldn't it? You know, the chariot is clapping on. He's like, whoa, whoa, hey, can you stop for a second? I want to talk to you. He didn't. I don't know if he did any of that or not. All it says is that he told him to go up and stand near the chariot. So if the chariot was still moving... At some point, we understand that it had to have stopped because he gets in the chariot with the Ethiopian official. But all he said is to go up to the chariot and stand near it. If that's not a closed door that he's telling you to open and just walk through, I don't know what it is. But I believe that Philip knew the voice of the Spirit of God. He knew the leading of the Spirit. I don't imagine this conversation happened while Philip was in a slow jog next to the chariot, but either way, the Spirit spoke, he moved. The power and direction of the Holy Spirit needs to be at the defining characteristic of the church. As the account goes, the why became clear after he was obedient. After he was obedient. He heard the man reading a prophecy about the Messiah from the book of Isaiah. And we understand it to be Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. You can go read that entire uh, passage. It's in the section that we understand as a suffering servant. But back then, they wouldn't have had chapter designations. They wouldn't have had verse designations. He would have been reading. And, and it's amazing that Philip recognized it for what it was. Shows his knowledge of the word. It notes that Philip uses the messianic prophecy to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with him. That's a pretty good why when you get up there. Right? You take the chance, you run up, you stand near the chariot, and all of a sudden you hear him reading a messianic prophecy from the prophet of Isaiah. He's like, whoo! As an evangelist, which Philip was oftentimes referred to, Philip the evangelist, he must have been excited. He must have been jumping in his heart when he heard that. 
The understanding here is that the Ethiopian official accepted Christ as his Savior, praise God, signified by the passion that led him to have his chariot stopped at the first sight of water. I don't know what kind of water he saw. I don't know if it was just a hole in the ground or what, but he saw water. Why can't I be baptized here? Isn't that cool? I mean, we're, we're, we're asking people, you know, if you're, if you're here, you've never been baptized in water, man, we want to celebrate with you. Baptism in water is a public declaration of your faith. It is a time for the church to come around you and celebrate with you and, and just have an amazing time where you can publicly declare that you're giving your life to Jesus Christ and that when you go down in that water, you acknowledge that your old self stays down there. And when you come up, you're new in Christ. That the Spirit is indwelled in you and you are a part of the church. Amen? So if you're thinking about it, please consider it. One of the coolest things as a pastor I get to do is baptize people. Dedicate babies is kind of fun, too. Of course, Philip the Evangelist, as he became known, was glad to accommodate. But what an encounter. The church grew that day because Philip responded to the leading of the Spirit. Philip also put on display for us another defining characteristic of the church, and that is that the church is meant to be multi-ethnic. God had planned for a multicultural church. God had planned for a church with all nations, all people, all colors, all looks, from wherever in the world. He had planned for the gospel to be expanded to whoever. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Listen to these verses and get them into your spirit this morning. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And this is what it was for. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea. And Samaria, as is recorded that Philip went to, and to the ends of the earth. This is the command that Philip was, was obeying. This is what he was, he was doing. He was understanding the power. He's listening to the power of the Spirit leading him here. The beginning of Acts 8, we are told that Philip followed the example of Jesus Christ, and he went to Samaria. He displays that the power that came on the day of Pentecost was provided for the church to advance the gospel to the ends of the earth. He didn't care what anybody looked like. He didn't care where they were from. If there was an opportunity to listen to the Spirit and to present the gospel of Jesus Christ to bring hope to somebody else, he did it. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. We're all familiar with this one, but we need to understand it and get it into our system. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything without the why. I'll add that in there. That's my emphasis. <laughs> obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Hallelujah. Ephesians 2, 14 to 16 says this. For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier. There's too many barriers. I think the church is meant to kick down barriers. And when we understand that Jesus Christ destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with his commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity. What an amazing phrase that is. My friend Luciano Lombardi wrote a book called New Humanity. I encourage you to read it. It's on the book of Ephesians. And it gets into this concept of what it means to be part of the church. It says, he made this new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God. Through the cross. By which he put to death their hostility. And the hostility, of course, he's talking about is between the Jews and the Gentiles. And the Gentiles is basically everybody in the world who's not a Jew. So it is more than just two. It's, it's the world. It's all nations, right? Galatians 3, verse 26 to 29 says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. It says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. 
If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, and the heir is according to the promise. The gospel is for everyone, regardless of race, regardless of nation, regardless of gender, regardless of background. And when we start being the gatekeepers, instead of the welcomers, we get ourselves in trouble. When we become gatekeepers, we turn the church into a social club. Spirit of God, don't tell us to lock gates. The Spirit of God doesn't tell us to shut doors to people that we maybe don't get along with. The Spirit of God doesn't tell us when your angry neighbor next door has a full two feet of snow in their driveway. The Spirit of God doesn't tell you, ha ha, look at him, he's going to have to do that tonight, he's going to be out till midnight. You know what the Spirit of God will tell you? He'll tell you to go get your shovel. And you know what? If you do it, you know what leadership is? It's, it's influence. Your neighbor across the street might come give you a hand. And then all of a sudden you've got a group of people who are seeing the love of Jesus Christ in action. That's the church. That's hope. That's joy. That's what we're meant to bring. We don't make barriers. We, we knock them down. Amen? We are not that far removed from the isolation of a global pandemic. And I know some of you are thinking, oh, just hearing that is exhausting, right? It has we wreaked havoc on our society, not only socially and economically, it has also taken a great toll on our mental well-being. To the point where even after the mandate, people still, in some cases, remained in isolation. And wherever the camera is this morning, I'm going to look at you. If you're home and you're listening to the, the live stream this morning... Obviously, if you're not well and you can't be out, that's fine. I hope, I hope that you are feeling the presence of God and you're feeling the church here this morning and you feel the Spirit's witness to what's going on here this morning. But if you're at home and you just got comfortable watching church online, I'm telling you, come on back. Amen. Come on back. You cannot survive as a church without fellowship. You can't. We are not meant to be solitary. People say, well, I can talk to Jesus. I have my Bible. God did not mean for this relationship to be solitary. He meant for us to build each other up in the most holy faith and to pray in the Holy Spirit and sometimes to snatch others from the fire. Come on, church. Right? Are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? So come on back. You need the church. The church needs you. You are part of this family. You need the fellowship. And at home, you may say, yo, I'm hearing the word. I'm even sensing the presence of God. Well, maybe the presence of God is saying, go there. That was for free. That wasn't necessarily in my notes. <laughs> I think the pandemic, however, itself, however, as, has overshadowed other major societal issues that arose during the already stressful season. While the world was reeling from the pandemic, racial unrest and bigotry that still exists in society was bubbling to the surface in North America and became something that couldn't be ignored any longer. George Floyd became a household name as the world watched live as his life was taken from him. The words, I can't breathe, echoed to the very walls and off the very walls we were confined by. He wasn't the only one, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice. Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery. Many more suffered similar fates. Excuse me. The level of animosity and stress created by these injustices added anxiety and animosity to a society that was already at a fever pitch. And I know some of you might be thinking, why is he getting so political? This is not politics. This is the kingdom of God. This is the love of one brother for another, one sister for another. This is acknowledging that God has called us to all nations. And when we see other nations, when we see other people, when we see other races hurting, we should hurt. How can we say that the church is the hope of the world? 
If we do not acknowledge and condemn such incredible injustices. This is why when we understand the word advocate, and I just, it's crazy, I wasn't going to mention this this morning, and forgive me again for time-wise, but I'm going to go here this morning, because when we mention the word advocate, it's come up so many times in the last few days. I'm reading a book, and I hear this word advocate, and they're explaining what it's about. I listen to a podcast this morning, and it's talking about advocate. I get up this morning, and where does it take me in my devotional time? John chapter 14. Talking about how he's going to send an advocate. You know what an advocate is? He's not someone who goes, the Holy Spirit, Jesus doesn't go and sit at the right hand of the Father and say, Lord, please forgive them again. Lord, yeah, they messed up. That Peter giving up that every day is like a circus. Like he messed up again. I know he said something he shouldn't have said. You know, he wasn't the best dad he could be. You know, he's gone through this. He didn't treat his neighbor. And, And I think he might have even made a weird gesture to somebody when he's driving on the highway. No confessions. Jesus is not at the right hand of the Father saying, can you forgive them one more time? He's at the right hand of the Father saying, Lord Jesus, you brought justice when you died on the cross. You have paid for his sins already. Do you hear what I'm saying? It is a confident life in the church. It is not a whimpering around, Jesus, I messed up again. I'm sorry. No one's waking up and understanding that his justice has covered you. His goodness, His mercy, His forgiveness, His blood has covered you. It is only the enemy that makes you want to beat that over your head every day. And to make you feel like garbage. God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. He has freed you from such lies. Jesus is not begging for your forgiveness. That's not what it means when He's interceding. He's speaking of the justice that was provided for you, the mercy, the grace that was providing for you on the cross. He's speaking it in the throne room. And he's speaking it into your life right now. If the church is truly meant to be multi-ethnic, multicultural, you can choose your words you want to use. And it is, it is, The church, dispersion of the church, you know, when it was open to the Gentiles, it was said the church is meant to be multi-ethnic. It is meant to be this. We should feel the pain when part of us is hurting and speak hope and life into that part. And how we do this as a body should show the world that the gospel is for everyone, regardless of race, nation, gender, or background. Dr. Derwin Derwin Gray, if I can go back to his book on how to build a multi-ethnic church again. This book, I read it some months ago, and it's affected me deeply. Just read this along with me. It says, The Apostle Paul envisioned and built local churches of reconciliation where ethnocentrism, in other words, no one race is better than any other. He says, Reconciliation where ethnocentrism, classism, and sexism were crucified on the bloody cross of Christ and by his resurrection power. Hallelujah. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's no ethnocentrism. There is neither slave nor free. There's no classism. There is no male or female. There is not male in charge of female, female in charge of male. There is no limitations into what God can do through through you, whether you're female or male. I want my daughter to grow up and understand that she can be a proclaimer of Jesus Christ. I don't know if I'm wishing for her to be a pastor or not. Whew. Boy, that sunk in for a minute. i got to take a knee. Oh. I'm just saying, I want her to hear the voice of God and know that when God speaks to her, if she says yes, that God will open the next door for her and she's confident enough to walk through it. Amen. In the name of Jesus, understanding that she can have the leadership to do that. And he closes this, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We cannot say that a defining characteristic of the church is multi-ethnic if we sit back and say nothing and do nothing to combat the injustice and inequality that still exists in society. Matthew 6, or Micah 6, verse 8, pardon me, says this, he says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Many of you know this. Say with me, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That instruction is New Testament. 
It may have been written 700 years before Christ came, but that instruction is New Testament. That is for us today, to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly. Philip wasn't hindered by what separated him from the Ethiopian man. He was drawn by what could and would and did unite them. After the Ethiopian man was baptized, it says in verse 39, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. Whoo, that's, a, that's something to think about, right? And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Hallelujah. We don't have any verified historical records necessarily to support Support it, but, but some, some believe that he was one of the first people to advance the gospel in northern Africa. And I don't think it's that much of a stretch. If he left rejoicing, if he went back to his home country rejoicing with an excitement, with the Spirit of God living in him, I had to believe that he had a realm of influence back there. Amen. And that he expanded the church into Africa. Amen? I don't think it's much of a stretch. He was certainly one of the first biblical representations of Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Tomorrow, again, if I may, is an American holiday called Juneteenth. And it's just a combination of two words, June and 19th. And it's maybe, I don't know how many people, I think more people should understand what it's about. It commemorates the day that General Gordon Granger led the Union soldiers into Galveston, Texas to announce the end of the war and the freedom of all enslaved people. June 19, 1865. But I would be remiss if I didn't note that it was some two years after President Abraham Lincoln made the emancipation, emancipation well, that's a tough word, Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, declaring the freedom of all enslaved people in America. And we can say, oh, that's American holiday. It doesn't affect us, boy. Yeah, it affects us. It affects us. Today, we need to acknowledge that much of the mindset that delayed the freedom of those who were enslaved is still prevalent today. And as a church, we can help be the difference and that we should lead the way by our example. And it might be just God saying, go stand near that person. And people will be all like, what are you doing, man? But it'll start a conversation. <laughs> it might be just God saying, go stand near that person. I can't get over how vague the instruction was. Go up and stand near the, the, the chariot of the complete stranger that's an official that could probably have you beheaded if he wanted to. The church is the hope of the world. Not because of anything we have done, but because we carry the greatest message of hope ever offered. Galatians 3, 28, 29. Again, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Welcome to the kingdom of heaven. The church needs to be defined by the Holy Spirit's power and wisdom. There's no way around it. I pray that we would all be as obedient as Philip. He was filled with the Spirit and it affected how he lived in society. This wasn't something he did in the church building. This was on the road to Gaza, on the desert road to Gaza, speaking to a complete stranger. The church needs to be defined by the hope of the cross that breaks down barriers regardless of race, nation, gender, and background. It didn't matter to Philip if it was a Samaritan, as it says earlier in chapter 8. It doesn't matter if it was a Philistine where he was down in, in, in what they call... I think the word was Aztaz, which is modern-day Ashdod, which is Philistine territory. It didn't matter if it was Jew, Greek, Asian, African, or even a Newfoundlander like me. God called him to be a witness in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the world, to every nation. 
And I will close with this reminder about the church's future. If you want to just close your eyes and just take this passage in with you from Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 to 12. Just listen to these words. And it says, and they sang a new song. This is what we have to look forward to, folks. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You wonder what heaven's going to look like? That's the description. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on earth. Then I looked and I heard a voice. Many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000, they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice they were saying, and imagine yourself saying it with them, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power, to go reach the world, amen? And wealth and wisdom to go reach the world and strength and honor and glory and praise to honor one another in the body of Christ and to advance the gospel to whoever will hear it. Amen. Father God, we receive your word this morning. We ask that you would seal it in our hearts. Father, I pray that my heart would be communicated that it has been communicated as you laid this message on my heart. I pray that it's been communicated through the power of the Holy Spirit today. I'm not up here preaching this with any political agenda other than to say that in the church we should love each other and that love should be the prototype, as Dr. Gray said, the prototype for the world to follow. We should be the example of how to love. And your word tells us, Lord, that if we want to love you, Lord, then remain. If we want to remain in your love is to obey your commands. And Lord, I understand that more today than I ever have. It took a long time because I'm stubborn and I'm thick-headed. And there's been many times that you've asked me to do something. And I said, why? But the moments I didn't say why and I ran up to the chariot, Lord, you opened those doors and I walked through. The blessing of God was there. Sometimes I walked through and there was a greater challenge, but then the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, Keep going, keep going, my son. Thank you for giving me the courage to listen. Give us as a church the courage to listen. It may be to speak up for somebody, Lord, who's being treated as less than. It may be to, to walk next door and to shovel somebody's snow not until much later in the year. It may be just seeing somebody that seems to be carrying a heavy burden and speaking words of life, putting our arm around their shoulder and saying, how are you feeling today? Lord, we are the prototype. We should be the prototype of how to love because we have been so deeply loved by you. So Holy Spirit, lead us as a church. Lead us. Lord, I admit as the pastor of this church, Lord, that we are willing to surrender. I speak it corporately, Lord, and I feel the agreement in this room that we are willing to surrender to your leading, Lord. Lead us in how you want to reach this community, this city, Lord Jesus, for you. Speak to our hearts, Lord. I know I'm the pastor, and people look at me as the vision setter, Lord, but we are a vision setting church. We are going to walk in vision as a church, Lord Jesus, because you are not a God of confusion. When you speak to me, Lord, you speak to others, and it is the same God that we're talking to. Open our hearts, open our minds to a grander vision of what you see as a church, one that reaches the far ends of the world. Lord, we do not set the parameters of our reach as the body of Christ, Lord. You set them. So, Lord, let us reach as far as you allow us to reach. It could be next door and it could be on the other side of the world. But we will be obedient. And we will act in the name of Jesus. Father, we love you. We thank you 
for the advocate who speaks to us daily and who advocates for us at the right hand of the Father. We thank you, Jesus. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's just worship the Lord for a few moments today. Before we leave, thank you. I, I don't know how long it was. <laughs> I'll get there. I'll figure out the, the timing. I know you're like, don't worry about a pastor. I know, but I don't want to take advantage of your time. But let's just take a moment and just sing and worship God and just say, Holy Spirit, speak this. Continue to speak this into my heart. Amen? Let's ask God, ask him yourself to seal this in your heart. And when we leave here today, leave commissioned in the name of Jesus. Amen? God bless you this morning. Why don't you stay with us as we sing uh, one last song this morning? <laughs> Your love is devoted Like a ring of solid gold Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of old Your love is enduring Through the winter rain And beyond the horizon With mercy for today Faithful you have been, faithful you will be, and you pledge yourself to me, and it's why I sing your praise, will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will makes us whole you show the weakness and the strength becomes our own and you're making me like you holding me in white bringing beauty from our shares and you will have your pride free of all the guilt rid of all the shame That's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. 
You know, I don't think I can stand up here and preach a sermon talking about Philip the Evangelist without giving you an opportunity this morning. So I just, I'd ask you to do this just to give everybody privacy, but will you just bow your heads for a moment? If you're here this morning and you're visiting and you're like, this is the first time you heard about Jesus and you probably have more questions than you do answers even, I'm excited about that for you. I, I encourage you to ask the questions, but... Today you have an opportunity to acknowledge the Spirit of God who's been speaking to you this morning. And I, I want you to hear what I've had to say today, but I want you to ask yourself, have I felt His presence this morning? Because if you have, He's the one you need to acknowledge. He's the one who's calling you home. And I just believe this morning that if you're here, you haven't accepted the Lord as your Savior, you have an opportunity. And if you're if you want to do that to say, will you just maybe as a sign of faith, just slip your hand up in this room this morning? It's okay. All right. All right. Thank you, Jesus. Father, Lord, we're going to leave here today, Lord Jesus, excited about being part of the church said about the fact that we carry a message of hope. And Lord, we just pray that you would continue to lead us by your spirit, that we would be willing listeners, that we would go with the power of Christ into our neighborhoods, into our workplaces, and represent you, show them the love of God. So Father, go with us now. Bless every dad in this place, every dad that couldn't be here, every grandpa, perspective, Dad. Bless every child, Lord, that we try to be the best example we can be to. But we love you today. We honor you. Bless you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Go with us now. Amen. God bless you this morning.